I'm starting work on a new suit of armour. Now, some of you know that I've come very close now to finishing my shining knight in shining armour type armour, late 15th century gothic field play. Do you see? Yeah? Uh -huh. That was actually me. Um, and when my childhood eyes first saw that kind of armour on the silver screen, well, naturally, you can imagine, the brain behind it thought, Whoa, I want one of those! I want one of those! Oh, I'm never going to get one of those! Well, now I've got one of those. Um, but not much later than that, actually, for the first time, my childhood eyes clapped eyes on another type of armour and thought, oh, wouldn't it be fantastic to have a suit like that? Oh, but I'll never get one. Uh, but, well, perhaps soon I shall, for in kit form uh, it has arrived in this box here. Now, it's, um, it, it's got a fair bit of weight to it, and as you can see, quite a bit of bulk, uh, but it's nowhere near as heavy as 15th century Gothic steel field plate. Uh, so perhaps that's a, a clue as to what it is. Um, I can give you more, though. Uh, the film which introduced us to it never actually referred to it as armour. Indeed, it is a moot point whether this is really armour at all. Uh, in the dialogue, the uniform is used to refer to it. And in every film subsequent, uh, this armour has never really been shown as doing the job that we traditionally associate with armour. And yet, the people making it today, they definitely call it armour because they want to believe that it's armour. Um, so, have you guessed what it is yet? Well, let's take a look in the box. Right, so it's a big box filled with vacuum-formed pieces of white plastic covered in a, a blue protective film. Whatever could it be? All right, you're geeks. So, yeah, most of you have All right, I know you're not a geek, but most of you are geeks. And so, I know, you've, you've guessed already. This is Star Wars Stormtrooper armour. Uh, specifically, this is A New Hope armour, because every film is very slightly different. And for the people who are really into the hobby of, of making this stuff, oh, it's very, very important. Because, uh, do you know, even in the second film, Empire Strikes Back, the, the shape, for instance, of the little plates on the backs of a hand was different. Did you know that? Well, you know it now. Uh, anyway, uh, there are several decisions that have to be made when coming up with uh, this sort of armour, if it is indeed armour. Um, and one of them is what sort of plastic should you choose and how thick. Uh, I went for 2mm ABS and I, I'm completely new to this, so I'm no, in no position really to give anyone an advice. Uh, as far as I know, 2mm ABS was a reasonable decision, uh, probably not too bad, um, and it's a reasonably popular one. So that's what I went for. Um, now then, the thickness of the armour, you may think the thicker is better, right? So thicker will be stronger, so that's good. N not necessarily. See, the thin uh, um, plastic will bend and bend and flip back to its original um, shape. So though even the thick stuff is still quite bendy. Um, so however thick you go, it's never going to be really stiff. Um, and the thick stuff, if it bends too far, it cracks. So even though the thicker stuff is stronger, in practical terms, it might not be more durable. Um, I went for two millimetres. It's a sort of a compromise. Uh, right, so there's a half of a thigh guard. Um, notice I don't say crease, because in this hobby, all the bits have been given their own names. And um, admittedly, I haven't memorised all the new names, but this is a, that's part of the thigh guard, and that's, uh, that's its fellow on the other side. And um, this is the, uh, the bit for the lower back, the abdomen, so that goes there. Uh, and we've got the other halves of the, the thigh, thigh guards, what most people in, in the medieval armoury would call a quise, but there you go. Um, and you've got to remember that when the originals were sculpted, they were just done by some bloke who had a vacuum forming company that was near Shepperton Studios, where they were filming Star Wars, and he was given concept drawings by Ralph McQuarrie. And if you look at those concepts, the original concept drawings, they're not actually the final design. Uh, they were just concept drawings. And so the man you know, took a few liberties to get it to fit a person and, and uh, the like. And I think he did a pretty good job. But don't forget that he was just throwing it together really quickly for some film that they were just making, and then they would throw all the stuff away because it was just a kids film which wasn't going to go anywhere and then they would have to clear the studio for the next thing um, and so he knocked out a number of these suits and they just had to look all right on the screen so perfect symmetry wasn't a high priority so the, the masters were just sculpted quickly by hand by eye out of clay and then they used those uh, for vacuum forming um, so um, the on the original moulds, the, the left of everything and the right of everything are not they're not perfect matches for each other. But do you notice that on the screen? No, you don't. So it's fine. Um, right. So here we got some uh, little bag of fixings. Uh, there's the bit for the bum. 
Uh, there's the back bit with its details, which of course have got their names, uh, which suggest purpose to them, but uh, the, it, it, they don't do anything. Uh, so that's the back of the torso. Here's the abdomen plate, which you see is also the groin in one piece. You might not have known that it was one piece because the, the belt, which is uh, that bit, that uh, hides the join, but actually, yeah, those two bits are just one continuous plate. Uh, one thing that you cannot do in this sort of armour is sit down. And you do not see Stormtroopers sitting down in the, in the movies. Actually, in, uh, in one of them, I think it's Rogue Trooper, there's, a, there's a, a Stormtrooper on the inside of a vehicle who's sort of sitting down. So they must have um, made a few alterations to make that possible. But he's not, he's not sitting comfortably. He's rather sort of perched. Um, uh, anyway, so that's the, that's the abdomen bit. Uh, and I've gone for... One of the reasons I picked this company, which is RWA, um, is that it offered different sizes. And uh, as a taller gentleman, uh, I've uh, therefore attempted to do that. Um, I'm not endorsing the company. I can say that uh, I, I found it perfectly easy to deal with. The detail and quality seems to be fine. Um, and um, the prices are not outrageous. But I do know that there are some rogue companies out there that people on the net warn you not to have dealings with. Uh, so I avoided those. Uh, general rule of thumb is if it's an awful lot cheaper than everyone else, or maybe you get two suits for the price of one or some amazing deal like that, it's probably a dodgy company. Uh, avoid. Uh, anyway, so here are the... What are, I, mean, I always They always made me think of um, chalk ices when I was a kid. In fact, even as an adult, they still do. These are meant to be the ammunition things. Um, but it's largely a belt to go around the middle of the soldier to hide a lot of the, uh, uh, of the joins. Um, and there, that thing there goes along the, the top of the knee. Um, wh I, what I'd like to see in a future Star Wars thing is one of these actually being used for... Um, uh, you know, he reaches for some more uh, ammunition. So there is a, something which looks a bit like a magazine in the side of the gun, which is just a sterling submachine gun. Um, so it possibly we could see someone run out of energy. And if it is a battery pack, he pulls that out and discards it, reaches down to this, and then maybe it does actually open in some interesting high-tech way. He squeezes it here, and then the top just goes, whoop, pops open, and there's the thing. And it's actually a very practical, quick way of getting a magazine out, because this could be made out of some wonder material that we don't ha have in the real world, uh, which suddenly, you know, if pressed in a particular way, will just part, liquefy, I don't know, do something high-tech. Um, so that's one for a future film, Star Wars. Uh, there you go, front of the torso, of course, the breastplate. Um, and, uh, ah, I'll talk about that one in a moment. Right, so uh, these, um, if they were medieval armour, would be called pauldrons, but uh, I think they're shoulder bells in um, Star Wars reenactment parlance. Um, and, oh, these are... They're called drop boxes, I think, but they're the little boxes that go... The, these boxes here, uh, the little boxes that go um, over your sort of top of your pelvis bit hanging down from the belt. And uh, uh, there are two bits to these. One goes inside the other, because they do actually have a, a back on them. They, uh, they have a thickness to them. Right, so what else have we got? Uh, more, more fixings, more little um, detailing for... The, oops! <coughs> Bag wasn't sealed. Um, more details for the helmet, little uh, little decals or decals, as some people say it, uh, for um, the the detailing on the helmet. Um, and uh, can you see the things there? Can you recognise those? They go on the helmet. Uh, little bits there for the the speakers in front of the uh, the mouth, uh, and the little grill for the. The, what I would call the mouth, but apparently it's called the frown for some reason on the helmet. It's called the frown. Uh, so we've got um, that's half of the lower leg, what I would call a grieve. There's the other halves, two of them, one inside the other. Uh, then we've got, uh, we've got the forearm bit there. You can see the inside of it. Uh, and that, that bit of detailing there has a name. I think it's called something like the cheese grater. Um, oh, you can see it better on the outside. There you go, the outside of the, the forearms, and they're all inside each other. Uh, the, these are the, called the ears, and these go on the side of the helmet. There's quite a bit of work on these to get them uh, to, to fit very precisely onto a, a, a surface which is curving in two directions. Uh, and so generously, I've been given four ears rather than two in case I go wrong. Uh, perhaps twice. Uh, I've got a, a holster for a, a gun that I don't have yet. 
Um, I've got uh, a piece of plastic grey piping, and yes, it's supposed to be grey, uh, and that is the, the little cylinder which is carried on the lower back of stormtroopers, and some people say it's a grenade, a thermal detonator, and other people give it other names, but that thing, you know, the thing which you've never seen used? That. Um, and these are the shoulder straps that will go over there, holding things together. Again, they're not called shoulder straps, they have their own. Uh, these are the don't, obviously don't do anything buttons that go on the front of the abdomen. Um, I've got a kit here. Um, I took the lazy way out and, and, and paid a bit extra for the kit of various straps and fittings for attaching all this uh, to the, the whatever goes on underneath so I can wear it all. Uh, these are the bits for the, the thermal detonator, so those go on the end, like that. See, a bit of detail there. If it is a thermal detonator, maybe it's um, some other thing. There's a pad for the inside of the helmet. Uh, that's uh, a bit of what I would call a, a rarer brace, but it's uh, upper arm armour. Um, there's another upper arm armour. We've got uh, an awful lot of these, which you have to cut out. These are little things for covering the ends of fixing. So there are lots of press studs, lots of poppers holding everything together, but you don't want those showing, so you have these to hide the ends, and there are quite a lot of those. Uh, this, this goes on the top of your left, I think it is, um, shin guard, your left greave, and it's called something like the, the sniper shield or whatever. So you can imagine if you, if you, if you kneel down with that, with that leg up, it, it, would, it, would, <laughs> it would keep you safe. Uh, it doesn't keep you safe. Um, these are the clips for attaching the thermal detonator or whatever it is. Um, this, ah, this again, I just paid a little extra to get the what they call the neck seal, the bit that goes around your neck underneath the helmet that uh, looks nice. Uh, here we've got some lengths of rubber, which will uh, be the trim on the uh, edge of the helmet, the bottom edge. Uh, here is the lens for the eyes of the helmet. Um, this is the belt. And I was tempted to make my own belt, it would have saved a little bit of money, and I would have perhaps done it more nicely, because uh, the belts that they actually used in the film were really rubbish and they frayed really badly. And you can see in pictures, uh, people have isolated stills uh, from the films, gone, oh look, you can get a good look at his belt here, and you can see it's fraying really badly, so we should make it out of the same sort of material that frays really badly. Um, but if you if you're making something to, to last, to, to appear in public in, you'd think you want to make a, a really good-looking belt that looks as though it's made to last. But uh, there is this concept of screen accuracy. Oh yes, screen accuracy. Now what is that? You might think that it is being accurate to what we, the audience members, see on the screen. Oh wow, that looks amazing. It looks symmetrical. It looks strong. It looks good for... it looks as it as we see it, as we see it in our imaginations partly, but as it is presented to us under the cinema lights on the screen. But uh, that's not what people mean uh, in the hobby by screen accurate. Instead, they mean accurate to what the stuntman or actor was wearing in the studio. And if what he was actually wearing was really shoddy and bendy and light and frayed and whatever, that is what we should make. Um, personally, I'm not absolutely, um, uh, to use the current expression, down with that, but uh, there we go. So we've got uh, more poppers, we've got uh, some specialist glue, which apparently is the right glue for gluing this sort of thing together, and we've got uh, some just sheets of plastic, and right now I forget what they're for, but these are noticeably thicker. These are uh, the thickness 2 mil as it goes into the vacuum former. But of course, once something is sucked up into uh, a, a semicircle like that, the middle of it is quite a bit thinner than 2 mil. Um, but they are for uh, reinforcing joins, I think, between the, the upper and lower bits, so I'll have to cut strips out of that. Uh, now then, what I've not shown you is the helmet, nor this. This is uh, the inside of one of the upper arms, one of the parts of the rarer braces. And can you see it's got a little it's got a little sort of shape in it. And the one on the other side hasn't got that. This is known as the thumbprint. Oh yes, and it's an example of screen accuracy at work. Um, you see, when the, well, they were making the armour in a bit of a hurry, shoving things into the mould, because they had to get it done by Friday, you understand, um, someone, I say the masters were made out of clay, someone accidentally pressed his thumb into the clay master. Oops! 
oh, well, never mind. No one's going to notice. It's on the inside of the upper arm on one side. No one's going to notice that. And what will it possibly matter? Well, it matters in that now people producing new moulds, uh, as these are, these are not the original moulds from Shepperton. This is someone else who's had to recreate them. They then are meticulously recreating the thumbprint and other errors, including asymmetries. Uh, Darth Vader's shin guards, for instance, are quite different lengths. Uh, but who notices that whilst watching the film? But people who want to, uh, I was about to say reenact, but it's not really reenactment, is it? Dress up as uh, Darth Vader. Uh, now some of them want to get it screen accurate. That is to say, they want to get his shin guards different sizes. But why would they be made different sizes? Because his legs aren't even real. They're robot legs. So you would make them to match, surely, wouldn't you? Uh, well, when they were in a hurry uh, making the film, they didn't quite make them match. And did you ever notice? No, you didn't. Screen accuracy sort of doesn't matter because our imaginations fill in and there was, you know, there was shadows and smoke and so forth and lots of other things to look at. Right, so helmet. This is the back of the helmet. And this, uh, as you can see, has come a long way from flat. So this is um, really noticeably thinner at the top. For it, there, for instance, there at the front, that is, that is a, whew, that's not even one millimetre. That's, that's not even, is that even half a millimetre? That is really thin there. So I'm going to have to be uh, careful with this bit. Uh, but there you go, there's the back of the helmet. And where's the front of the helmet? Oh, no. Ah, here it is. Right. Um, so, doesn't look like much now because there's a lot of detail to go on, but uh, this will, in time, be the front of the helmet. And um, in order to uh, show you what this should end up like, I have here one that I bought from a company called Hasbro. They produced these a few years ago. I think this was called the Black Series, something like that. And this is based not on A New Hope, but on Rogue One, which, if you know your Star Wars, is set immediately before A New Hope. In fact, it, it sort of ends with the beginning of A New Hope. Um, but this is not screen accurate because it is perfectly symmetrical for, for a start, uh, which I, I like. I like the fact that this is perfectly symmetrical um, because surely a high-tech society would produce these you know, perfectly symmetrically. But uh, the ones that are based on the, sh the original uh, Shepperton moulds, and there is a company at least claiming to be using the ori original Shepperton moulds, uh, they are really quite far off symmetrical. Um, so when you've got one in your hands and you look, you're scrutinising it, it's it's way off, but um, some people say that's part of the charm of it. Though actually, I prefer. Sorry, guys, but I, I prefer symmetrical. Also, uh, this is this is very white. It's also made out of really thick, strong, satisfyingly thick and strong material, which I like. And it's got a slightly rubberized um, uh, edging here, which is molded on in one piece. That's never going to fall off. Um, one difference between A New Hope and uh, Rogue One, this is for people who are really, really interested, is that this bit here, here is actually a, a recessed grill, um, whereas they're just painted stripes on A New Hope. And we've got grills here, actual grills, rather than just, just painted on pretend grills. It'll look like a grill from a distance through the camera on a screen. No one will ever know. Um, now then, uh, so do, do I recommend these? Well, unfortunately, they only do the helmets. If Hasbro had made the whole suit in this quality and at the sort of price that this was sold, I'd have bought it in a flash. If you want a fully assembled Shepperton style helmet, you'll pay 400 and something pounds for it. This was 65 pounds, something like that, a lot less. And I think it's also a lot better. Um, and, but there is uh, one gripe I have with this particular thing uh, produced by Hasbro, and that is that it's got a voice changer in it. If I push a button here, it uh, activates a little voice changer and it gives you... So, now when I talk into it, I have a sort of American accent and a slight echo. Okay, so where's the speaker for that? Well, I mean, where would you put the speaker? You've got so many places to hide uh, the speaker, haven't you? So, for instance, you've got uh, this grill here, or this grill here, or the mouth, which has got uh, uh, little, little holes in it as well, or immediately in front of the mouth, this, you could hide a little speaker grill in that, or there, I mean, it looks just like a speaker grill, or there, or there, or there, or there are even two on the back. But why would you put it on the back? I mean, obviously you'd want to put it on the front where it projects the voice forwards because that's where, you know, you, you face someone, you want to talk to them, you put the speaker on the front. They put it there. They've, they've not just put it on the back. They've actually added a grill 
when they had so many, they had ten different grills that they could have used, and they, they added one. Okay, so there's my criticism of the Hasbro product. Otherwise, Hasbro, I think it did a fantastically good job. Um, if uh, I have a criticism of the design of this uh, as, as, a, as, a, as a helmet, it's just this uh, overhang at the back, because if I put it on like this, it, um, oh, let me turn the speaker off. There you go. It actually stops me from raising my head. I can only get it to there, and then that's it. If I only get to there, I can't go to there. And uh, so if you look at uh, uh, designs of other Stormtrooper helmets from the more recent films, they've generally got more of a cut-off at the back so that the actors could raise their heads. Uh, right, and I see from my screen that I'm running out of time, so I better change angle. Here you see a selection of other items that I have gathered together in order to complete my Stormtrooper armour. These include Marigold Gardening Gloves. That's what they're called in Britain. Marigold is a, is a brand of, of glove. And uh, the, the thick black ones are for gardening, and they are what they actually used in the film. Though um, they do apparently get rather hot and sweaty, uh, so some people have tolerated, they've lowered their standards of screen accuracy, and they tolerate uh, other sorts of uh, black glove, because who could really tell that they're meant to be specifically this kind of glove? But anyway, another solution is you get white gloves, uh, little cloth ones put on the inside, and apparently that makes things a little bit more uh, comfortable, less sweaty in the long run. And the ones I got uh, came in a big packet of, of loads, because I got them very cheaply uh, on eBay. Um, but that's fine, I've got plenty of uses for this sort of glove, uh, handling uh, antique artifacts and uh, steel armour that I'm trying to clean, doing pencil drawings, uh, impersonating traffic policemen, and of course burglary. Um, and um, while I've had it, since they're cheap, I got a few packets of those. Um, Chelsea boots. Now then, this is the classic Chelsea boots, once very fashionable. And they are still making these, partly because there are so many people who want to be a stormtrooper. Now you can spend quite a lot of money um, getting up a proper Star Wars Chelsea boot. And they actually have um, patent leather, which is white. They're, they're, and I think they have a little Imperial logo on them, but they're not screen accurate. Oh no, if you want to be screen accurate, and while you're at it, save quite a lot of money, because these are very cheap, uh, you can just buy a cheap pair of uh, Chelsea boots, and then just get some household... Yeah, that's what they use, just household white paint for painting the inside of your house or whatever, and paint them white. And if you look at the... Uh, uh, the photographs in detail of the, the boots that they used in the movies. They were quite scuffed and rubbish looking, but you know, there you go, Chelsea boots. Um, then you'll need things. Uh, this is um, for doing a uh, pop rivet. There are only three or something pop rivets in the whole thing, uh, and there are uh, little um, dies and hitty things for doing other sorts of rivety fixings. Um, and I've got a specialist pair of uh, plastic cutters. You can see they're, they're slightly curved. Um, they're very short, so lots of leverage, and apparently these are the thing you want, so we've got a pair of those. Uh, magnets, strong magnets. Uh, these aren't used in the final thing, but uh, when you're trying to uh, hold bits of plastic, which are, imagine the, the, the forearms, the two halves of the forearms, you want the two bits in the middle somehow pinched together. Well, you can't put a peg on, but you could use powerful magnets to hold the glue while they're setting. Uh, black elastic of various uh, thicknesses for the various things that need to be elasticated. And Velcro, black and white for the same. Uh, well, apart from Velcro. And, of course, paints. Um, and, uh, oh my goodness, people have gone to so much trouble to find the exact paints used. They were Airfix or Humbrol. They just got them from a model shop down the road. Um, and what exact colours? Well, I, I've been looking at all sorts of charts and I've got these exact colours, uh, because these are supposedly the ones they used. But, you know, judging the colour of something from a film is extraordinarily difficult. Um, and you, the film stock that was shot, uh, that was used on the day, influences it, but also the way that stock was processed influences it. And, of course, the lighting that was used on the day influences it, because uh, the, the lights they use aren't pure white light, they have a colour to them. And then, uh, after the editing, they have to make uh, copies and the duplication, and how that, the, the film stock that was used for the duplication, and how exactly that was processed influences the colours. And, um, uh, and then, of course, uh, all the above age over time, and then they get digitised, and then they remaster the digital version, so that the colours you're seeing are so many stages removed from the original colours, but uh, it's good to be precise. Apparently. Uh, and under all of this goes this big black suit. Well, where do you get a big 
black one-piece suit from, and some sort of special. No, nope, nothing specialist at all. This is called a motorcyclist's base layer. And uh, again, eBay, really not very expensive. I think it was 18 pounds, something like that. Uh, so not that bad. The entire lot has set me back between four and 500 pounds, I would say. Just what sort of armour is this? If it is ablative armour, as suggested by the game Traveller, uh, then that would make sense because it's quite stiff and this would protect you from, from the blows from things like wooden sticks, although it's been established now from the film Rogue One that this is not particularly wooden stick resistant as you would expect. But yeah, let's imagine that it's stiff and so would protect you from the impacts of blows and the stabs from knives and so forth. If you're meant to be policing the galaxy, you want something pretty stab proof and wooden stick resistant resistant, wouldn't you? Um, and you'd expect it to be made out of some super high-tech polymerized, I don't know, some stuff that doesn't exist yet, which would make it bulletproof. And so that's why people have to use lasers, or as they're known in Star Wars, blasters. So they're not lasers, so reflecting them isn't going to work. There's just a load of energy coming in. So maybe ablative armor would be the thing. It's like the, the heat shield on the bottom of the re-entry capsule that uh, they used to get, come back to, the, to Earth from the moon trip. So it was falling through the atmosphere, gaining speed, and the bottom of it was heating up and heating up, and this big, thick lump of, of material on the bottom of it was ablating. It was being heated up, and it was vaporizing and carrying away the heat and energy, and thus protecting the astronauts inside. So maybe this is ablative armor. It gets hit, and in the film you can get a good boof effect, because you know, part of the armor is actually being ablated, and it's vaporizing, and thus keeping the soldier inside safe. That's never what we're shown, of course, in Star Wars films. No. Apparently just a wooden stick will do it, and every single shot that hits uh, a stormtrooper seems to just kill him instantly. I've even heard it uh, suggested that, that that's what it's for, it's to prevent wounding, and so there's no, there's no screaming and, and, and writhing about. Instead, you're either dead or fine. No, that's not really what armour's for. But anyway, what does this armour do? You see, I look at this, and immediately my imagination runs right, and I think, ah, oh, yeah, brilliant. Oh, I can see what, 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 what this is doing. So, for instance, it's great for communicating with people. So you've got loud hailers and big speakers out the front, so you can, you know, as you police the galaxy, you can order crowds about. And you've got all sorts of sensors and sniffers, perhaps. Uh, this grill here and here might be sensing the air for toxins or, or the prey. Maybe it makes, turns you into a bloodhound, because you've got the scent of the the person on whose trail you are, you are. so um, you know, all sorts of sensory information coming in here, that would be great, and it uh, acts as a gas mask and filter against all sorts of toxins and bacteria that might be used against you, you know, bacteriological and chemical warfare is a thing we've got to worry about, and maybe even nuclear warfare, the fallout dust and what have you, will keep you safe from that, maybe, um, and the perception of your eyes. Now, this is what they call a stunt helmet, and that the eyes are, uh, the, the, the lenses in the eyes are fairly flat. But in the hero helmets, the ones that were used for the big close ups uh, in the movies, they've got bubble eyes, and uh, the, the, uh, the, the lens domes out like that. Um, and one of the reasons that the stuntmen didn't wear those is that the bubble eyes are actually quite difficult to, to look through because they, they distort the world around you and that's not what you want when you're trying to run through a set and commit, uh, you know, carry out a stunt. Uh, so the stuntmen and people far away from the camera wore these, but just the big close-ups, they had the bubble eyes and, oh, that suggests to me wide-angle view, yeah, like, like insect eyes or whatever. So if you're wearing one of these helmets, you have an amazing situational awareness around you and you, you've got zoom and head-up displays and grid and range finders and all sorts of militarily useful things, all going on in here. Yeah, we're not shown any of that. It appears to be just a bit of a rubbish helmet that, if anything, restricts your view. But, but you know, you can see the potential for this. Now, this is the point I'm going to make about this helmet now. I think this, the front of this helmet, is why I'm here talking to you now. And I think it's why you are watching this video. You're only really interested in the front of this helmet. The rest of the armour, you know, all these other bits, um, they're not that great. You know, they're not brilliantly well shaped. They don't work particularly well. If the rest of the armour, um, if the helmet were like the rest of the armour and it was just another sort of vaguely medieval-y looking thing rendered in plastic, um, or the usual sci-fi look, um, I don't think we'd, we'd be wanting to make the armour, because the rest of the armour is not that great. But you stick this face on the top of that armour and suddenly it becomes a masterpiece. This, this design of this face is an absolute masterpiece. Look at the expression of it. In, it's not ridiculously scowly and aggressive looking, and yet there is something a little bit, a little bit sinister and malevolent about it, but only very slightly. Um, 
So you can sort of believe this as a policeman's helmet, policing the galaxy for the, 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 the Imperium. And uh, it's white, which looks rather good. And it's not the traditional um, uh, colour that you associate with armour. But you can imagine a police force, yeah, they could be white so they stand out. Um, and all these, these, these gizmos, the, um, it's sort of human and it's sort of robotic. It's, it's, it, it gets the best of both worlds. Um, uh, I think that this is an absolute design classic and um, deserves to be remembered and, and cherished. I love it, I love it, I love it. <laughs>